So welcome everyone to CS261. Uh, I think of this class, or in my mind, the title of this class is a second course in algorithms. This is a natural se uh, sequel to 161. Uh, the official title uh, in the course books of a different optimization and algorithmic paradigms. Uh, so before I do any technical content, let me just open with a few words about what the goals of this course are. So what you can hope to learn if you choose to take 261. And so there's really two different goals, or two major goals. And the uh, course splits roughly 50-50 down the middle with respect to each of these two. So the first one, which is going to be very much in the spirit of CS161, the focus will be on algorithms, fast algorithms, for fundamental problems, for fundamental and well-solved problems. And indeed, if we were at a semester school, uh, so the first part of 261 would really just be you know, what we would do in weeks 11 through 14 of a semester-long version of uh, Introduction to Algorithms. And uh, so the theme here is, you know, out there in the world, there's a collection of fundamental problems that are simultaneously kind of basic and flexible enough to model lots of different applications, but also, happily, admit fast algorithms for their exact solution. So you saw several of these in 161. So you can think, for example, about the shortest path problem. So what did you learn in 161? You learned the definition of the problem and various variants, maybe negative edge costs or non-negative edge costs. You learned some famous algorithms, Dijkstra's algorithm, the Bellman-Ford algorithm, uh, you know, part, definitely parts of the greatest hits of, uh, of algorithms. And hopefully, you know, maybe you also got some practice recognizing that certain problems which don't immediately look like a shortest path problem nevertheless can be solved using the shortest path algorithm. So for example, maybe planning a sequence of decisions over time might have been something that, uh, that you saw. So, um, so problems of this form that both come up all the time and also have fast algorithms, those are pretty much the top priority to cover in a class like that. It's kind of like the number one thing I want to give you uh, before you leave the course. So why? Well, you know, a major skill you can get by taking 261, you couldn't get it elsewhere, would be you avoid reinventing the wheel. Okay, so first of all, you recognize out there in the world the problem you care about really is just something that's already well solved. Once you recognize it as such, you have in your toolbox some algorithms you can just code and solve the problem quickly. You don't have to invent a new algorithm from scratch. And again, also a major thing that we'll practice you know, a little more in the homework than in the lectures but still, the skill that I hope you get is the ability to recognize that many problems out there that show up in the real world are really just thinly disguised versions of the basic problems that we focus on. And again, maybe you saw some examples of that. We would say shortest paths in intro to Okay, so you already know about shortest paths, so obviously we'll be covering you know, other problems, sort of more sophisticated problems. So in the first five weeks, we'll talk about max, the maximum flow problem. We'll start on that today. Uh, we'll talk about computing graph cuts, which is closely related to the max flow problem. Uh, we'll talk about computing matchings in graphs. And then this will culminate in the study of linear programming, which is one of the sort of most general uh, problems for which we know uh, algorithms that are efficient, both in theory and in practice. So we'll, we'll talk about algorithms for all of these problems and also why you should care about these problems, what kinds of things they model. Uh, so you know, the running times won't be quite as blazingly fast as in 161. In 161, almost everything winds up being near linear time. So these won't often be near linear time. They might be, say, quadratic time. But they're still fast enough that generally, you know, if there's a problem that you actually care about and it reduces to something on this list, you should be pretty happy. Because there are off-the-shelf algorithms which solve them uh, pretty quickly. So that's going to be the gist of the first half of the class. Now, unfortunately, lots of problems that you're likely to bump into uh, in your future career don't actually fall into this collection. Okay? So the second course goal is to give you some tools for dealing with problems that, while important, are not so well solved. And we'll look at two categories primarily. There's a bunch of different ones pushed over here, but in 261 we'll focus on two things. So first of all, we'll talk about problems which are NP-hard. 
meaning problems where we don't think with any polynomial time algorithm for solving it exactly, uh, unless you know, the p equals np, uh, unless p equals np. So you have to do something else. So you have to compromise when you want to solve uh, np hard problems. So for example, one thing we'll look at is heuristics. And again, this is often how you actually deal with np hard problems out there in the real world. So we'll say, OK, if you want, what's a principled way to design algorithms? Well, not guaranteed to always be correct are at least you know, mostly correct, hopefully almost or all of the time. And so we'll look at a lot of the design and analysis techniques for, for heuristics, building, for example, on our work in linear programming in the first half of the course. The other category of sort of you know, hard to solve exactly problems are so-called online algorithms. So this is pretty anachronistic at this point. So this, does not, this is not referring to the internet. This is not referring to social networks. Online algorithms just means your algorithm is forced to make decisions without knowing the future. Or you can think about it without knowing the entire input. And so it's almost like it forces you into a greedy type algorithm, even if you wish you could do something smart. And so that comes, as you can imagine, all the time. You have to design algorithms to make decisions that are important, but you don't really know what's going to happen later. So these problems, again, come up a lot. And you probably haven't seen about them, anything about them in your previous algorithms courses. 261 is where you learn uh, the basics of that. Uh, I guess so one other comment um, just about the course. I sort of think of there being two audiences for 261. Both audiences, I think, you know, for me, are very important. I'm very interested in. The first audience, some of you, this, is, this will be the last algorithms class you've ever taken. So you'll graduate this year or next year without taking any more. And so for, for you, I really want to pack the course with essentials. Right? So if I only get 10 weeks of your time to tell you sort of algorithms you don't know yet, I think in about 261, I think about you know, what, you know, what are the algorithms that make the cut that are worth telling you about in this, in this last course you're ever going to take on algorithms. On the other hand, there's a second audience. Some of you might be contemplating deeper study of algorithms. So maybe you're thinking about research, or at the very least, maybe you're thinking about other 200 and 300 level theory courses. And so for you, I want to give you a little bit of a sense of the cutting edge. So when those opportunities present themselves, we'll talk about recent developments and the topics we're discussing. Uh, and I want to give you a little bit of a glimpse of like what lies in your future if you take more, say, 200 and 300 level algorithms courses uh, here at Stanford. So that's the second thing we'll, we'll talk a little bit about. So just if I think about sort of where 261 lies in the overall curriculum, I think of it as sort of a gateway to advanced algorithms, at least for the second of the two audiences that I mentioned. Okay. And uh, indeed, so after, you, after you're done with 261, you're extremely well equipped to take any of the other uh, 200 or 300 level algorithms courses that we teach at Stanford. And now there's, there's a bunch of them, actually. Uh, 261, it also sort of interpolates, I think, between just the pace and the difficulty of 161 and what you can expect to see in courses, either other 260-something courses or 300-level courses. Uh, so it's definitely going to be a faster pace than 161, but definitely not as fast as when I teach 300-level courses. I mean, I sort of have this like mental model for the typical student in each of these classes. So you know, when I teach 161, that's required for all majors. Right? So I look out there in the audience, and my baseline assumption is that a constant fraction of the students would rather not be there, <laughs> and maybe even hate math. And I try to give them a great course, despite the fact that that's kind of the type of computer science to say, which is fine. 261, I assume you want to be here. I think, I think of this as a self-selecting group. I think if I'm talking to an audience of people who like algorithms and want to know more about it, I'm not going to assume that you necessarily love math, but I think I am going to assume that you don't hate math. That's sort of how I think of this class. Through internal classes, I'm thinking more about people who really want to do research. PhD students and undergrad and master's students that are thinking of going on for grad school. Okay, so that's sort of a another level of uh, sort of depth and sophistication that I'm assuming. So that's where I'm coming from in, in 261. That's sort of how I think about this class. All right. So pause for questions in a second, but I'm sure one question that's on many of your minds is, so what do you have to do? So it's a liberal. Uh, well, for, let me first mention a non-deliverable. Uh, so every week is going to be an exercise set. It's going to be posted usually on Thursday or Friday. And it will cover, you know, it will be related to the two lectures that just happened earlier in that week. Okay? And these are not to be turned in. We will not grade them if you turn in any solutions. Okay? 
So the point of the exercise sets, it's really a framework for you. It gives you sort of a litmus test for whether or not you're understanding what's going on in the 261 language. So if you can answer those exercise set problems, uh, then you're in good shape. And if not, then, well, you know, they're not turned in, so just talk to us in office hours. We're happy to just walk you through the solutions for anything that doesn't make sense. Now, as far as incentives to actually look at it, to actually do the exercise sets, uh, the final exam, uh, I'm going to promise you at least 50% of it will be drawn either directly or will be minor variants of these problems that show up on the exercise set questions. Okay, so it's what I think is really important for you to take away from the lecture. So no coincidence, it's also what I'm going to be testing uh, at the end of the class. All right, so that's a non-deliverable. So what are you graded on? There's going to be four problem sets. So that'll be 75% of the grade. Uh, so these are to be done in groups. Groups of up to three, uh, and only one write-up per group. Okay, so you can split up the problems amongst you, or what I'd recommend is at least at least two people work on your problem, so you can exchange ideas uh, and collaborate. So a few goals for the problem sets. So one thing I'm trying to do is just uh, you know basically give you a way to think long and hard about algorithms outside of class, you know, which is really kind of the experience of learning algorithms. You probably already saw this some in CS 161. Tough problems, you just got to think about for a long time to crack them. But in doing so, you know, afterwards you feel like you're a little smart. Okay, so I want to sort of give you that experience through the problem sets. Uh, I want to give you an opportunity to collaborate with other students, which especially in a class like this, for these kinds of problems, I think it's really fun, actually, uh, to cooperatively solve these problems. And then third, you know, through the problem sets, I'll be able to supplement, complement the material that I, that I do in lecture. So you'll actually learn new, cool results through the problem sets. For that reason, you know, they're pretty challenging. You can't sort of learn stuff for free. It takes some work. Um, so you're going to have two weeks to do them. They'll go out every Tuesday starting next week. Uh, there'll be two weeks to turn them in. Uh, so budget some time for that. They, I think most of you will find them challenging. Interesting, I hope, the challenging. Um, and there is a late day policy. I'm not going to talk about it in class. It's up there on the, on the website, which, again, is live. That's uh, used to so that's the first thing, and then I alluded to a final. <coughs> so the final will be in class, three hour exam at the time specified by the registrar. Uh, and this is very different from the problem sets. In particular, the final question is going to be much easier than the problem set question. As reflecting the fact that in class exam, uh, you don't have two weeks to do it. And the goal is also quite different, right? So, Whereas here, you're really going to be building and extending the lecture material. For the final, I'm really just making sure that you've mastered the most basic and useful concepts that we teach in 261. So it'll all be stuff that you saw in lecture. Um, if you sort of understood all the lectures, it should be really quite easy. In fact, last year, I actually got complaints on my evals that the final was too easy, which is, I don't know, you know my reputation in CS 161, but never had that complaint. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And again, as I said, at least 50% of it, you already know what the questions are. They'll be drawn from the, from the exercise sets. Okay. So, and then that's it. That's the extent um, of the deliverables. Any questions about 261? Uh, so there's no textbook, uh, but I will be posting lecture notes. I write the lecture notes after I give the lecture. So they should be up on the web generally within a week of when the lecture occurs. Okay, so that'll be the primary source. I'll post other resources uh, as needed. And again, as I mentioned, you know, the videos will be taped and up on YouTube within a couple of days after the lecture. So if you want to rewatch one or if you're out of town or something or sick for one, uh, you can catch up uh, through the through the. Then uh, let's go ahead and start our first topic, uh, the maximum flow problem. So this is a stone cold classic algorithm structure. It's been around for over a half century. So it's very easy to understand intuitively. Let me first just kind of give you a sense for it through an example, then I'll give you the formal definition. So it's a problem in graphs or networks. So I'm going to draw a picture which is going to look a lot like the pictures we drew back when you studied shortest paths, although the semantics are going to be different. So 
we have a directed graph. You can also look at maximum flow in undirected graphs, so I'll ask you to explore that in the first exercise set. But for lecture, let's just think about directed graphs. Each edge has a number attached to it, and the meaning of that is the edge's capacity. So that's the amount of stuff that the edge can carry, in some sense. And the max flow problem is all about understanding how much stuff can you push through the network from S, which is called the source vertex, to T, which is called the sample vertex. So for example, in this network, it's clear, or if you think about it a little bit, actually, let me ask you to think about it a little bit, uh, even though I haven't defined the problem formally. So just informally, if these numbers represent how much stuff an edge can carry, what would be your guess about how much stuff you could push from S to T? So I heard of you five, which is a good, good answer. So here'd be a way you could push five units. You send two units on the upper two hop path, two units on the bottom two hop path, and then a fifth unit on the zigzag path. Okay. And the amount of stuff you're pushing across any edge is at most its capacity. Right? So we're sending, uh, so we are sending three units of flow here, two units of flow here, three units of flow here, two units of flow here, and one unit of flow here. Okay. And so the point is all of those purple numbers are at most the white numbers. The most of the so how do we know we can't send more than five units though? Is that obvious? This is a way to get five, so it shows we can get at least five. Can we possibly have more than five? <coughs> we couldn't, and it's actually kind of obvious to see why, which is, you know, just look at the source vertex S. We can only pump five units out of the source. So that's the total capacity outgoing from the source. So five is the best case scenario. We can actually achieve. Okay. So that's sort of the gist of the maximum flow problem. Let me define it a little bit more formally. So given as input a directed graph. So vertices V, directed edges E. Again, max flow. The algorithms we'll, we'll talk about. Also work on undirected graphs with minor modifications, as you'll think about. There's a source vertex S, sink vertex T, and a capacity. And for simplicity, let's think of the capacity as integers, so an integral capacity, UE, for all edges. Okay. So just like a picture of it. So that's the input. Now, what are the feasible solution. So what, what are the objects that an algorithm is allowed to output? Well, they're going to be flows. And so in the picture, I described flows by drawing these paths. But for algorithms, it turns out to be much better to just think about sort of the superposition of the paths and think about these purple numbers. Remember, these purple numbers are what's the total amount of stuff being sent on a particular edge. So we're going to work with these flows on edges. Okay. So what is a flow? You assign a non-negative number to every edge. And again, in this example, these non-negative numbers correspond to the 3, 2, 1, 2, and 3. Those are the non-negative numbers I'm talking about. And to be a flow, you have to satisfy two types of constraints. So subject to. So first of all, there are capacity constraints. You can't send more stuff on an edge than it has capacity. So the way you write that is just Fe, the amount of flow, is the most the capacity for all edges. Okay, so again, those are capacity constraints. And then off at, the other thing we need is we need what are called conservation constraints. So if you look at any vertex V, other than the special source and the special sink, it better be the case that the amount of flow going in is the same as the amount of flow going out. Okay? What I mean by the amount of flow going into the vertex V is just what you think. I look at all of the edges that enter V. I sum up the total amount of stuff that any of them carry. Flow out, I just look at the outgoing edges, and again, I sum up the flow that's outgoing. 
It just says the total flow coming into V should be the same as the total flow going out. For example, here, take a vertex like this one. Right? So we have, we have three units of flow going from S to this vertex. So three units go in. Three units also go out. It's split two on this edge and one on this edge. But still, the total flow out is three, which equals the total flow. Okay. So that, by definition, is a flow. There's a non-negative number on each edge that meets the capacity and conservation constraints. So if you have an output number satisfying this, it's a feasible solution. Of course, you could just set everything to zero. It would be a feasible solution, not so interesting. So we actually want a particular flow of an X. So the goal is to, amongst all flows, maximize the flow value. What is the flow value? It's just the total amount of stuff going out of the source. Here, right, the total flow would be five. If both of those edges are the same. <laughs> so one, <clears throat> one minor detail, don't worry about this if it, if it hasn't occurred to you. But um, what, you know, what's the point of the source? Stuff's supposed to go out of the source. So there's no point for there to be an edge going into the source. Okay? That has no point. Similarly, there's no point for an edge out of the sink, because stuff is destined for the sink. So just think like we pre-process the graph in advance and we delete any edges going into S, we delete any edges going out of it. So no edges into S or out of T. And this is without loss of generality because those edges would be not useful for a maximum flow. Okay? So S just has edges only going out, T has edges only going out. That's a flow. Among all flows, we want the ones that push the maximum possible amount out of the source. As we'll see, this is the same as maximizing the amount of stuff going into the sink. Okay, so just as five units go out of S, there's also five units going into it. Okay, so that would be the same, same problem. All right, so questions about the definition of the maximum flow problem. Yeah. Can there be multiple sinks? Good question. So that'll also show up on the exercise set. Uh, the short answer is yes. The short answer is that, and this is the point of the exercise, that again, maximum flow in the seemingly more general case of multiple sources reduces to the case that we're covering in class. And again, that's something I hope really, it'll be an explicit theme, especially in the exercise sets. That we'll cover a basic algorithm, but actually lots of bells and whistles you can really just reduce back to the basic algorithm. And it's very useful for that. Good question. Another question you might ask is just, you know, why should we spend time on the maximum flow problem? Right, so who cares about the maximum flow problem? So like, like all of the kind of, you know, great algorithmic problems, maximum flow is both just sort of arises naturally, right? So sometimes you just literally care about the maximum flow problem. But and something that's a little less obvious, but we'll see throughout the course, is that many applications are really just thinly disguised versions of maximum flow. And again, we'll give some air time to that uh, in future lectures. So, for example, you know, what would be some very kind of obvious applications, some very literal translations? You can think about road traffic and transportation networks, you can think about data packets and a communication network. You can think about oil being routed through an oil distribution network. And indeed, this algorithm has been used in all of those applications. And it's sort of a very natural way to, to model them. Uh, less obvious would be why something like image segmentation, so given an image, classify the pixels into a foreground and a background, that also turns out to be reducible to the maximum flow problem, as we'll see next week. OK, so that's the problem. I want to start talking about algorithms for the problem. And you know, again, because you're sitting in this class you know, and, and you know, I'm getting lectures on this, you probably have in your mind, OK, so it's going to be some fast algorithm. Okay? But keep in mind, you know, if you've never seen this problem before, without thinking about it, for all we know, it's NP bar. So it would be cool if there was an efficient algorithm. Because later in the course, we're going to get spoiled in the first half. But in the second half, we're going to have equally natural problems that don't have any fast algorithms. But so here we're still in the happy case where we have fast algorithms. OK, so how should we tackle the maximum flow problem? How should we think about it? How can we compute one of these things? Well, let me give you idea number one. 
uh, and yes, by number by idea number one, I mean this will not be sufficient. It's a good starting point. Which is okay. So we learned a bunch of greedy algorithm, uh, sorry, algorithm design paradigms in CS one sixty one. And in many problems, a good one to start is with is greedy uh, greedy algorithms. Very commonly, greedy algorithms do not work, but usually, at least trying them out and seeing why they don't work, you understand the problem better and you get a better idea of what a good algorithm is going to look like. Okay? So even when they don't work, it's often a useful exercise. All right, so what's going to be our first attempt? Again, attempt number one, so giving it away that it's not going to work, it's an applicant to try. A greedy algorithm for the maximum flow problem. So we're just going to compute a sequence of flows, each one having higher value than the previous one. So we just start with the all zero flow. Okay. Again, sending everything to zero obviously satisfies capacity and conservation constraints. Now we try to make the flow bigger. So how do we try to make the flow bigger? Well, actually, it's, it's sort of a lot like what we did in, when we first sort of played around with that very first example. We're going to look for a path where there's capacity left over on every edge of the path, and then we'll route flow on that path. Okay. I think that's a very natural first algorithm to try for the max flow. So a little more formally, we search the graph for a path for S to T. So that all of the edges have room, meaning the current amount of flow on the edge is strictly less than the capacity for all edges on the path. So I guess we need a subroutine to do that. So how fast can we accomplish that? I give you a graph, I give you a flow, and I want you to find me a path from X to T with this room on every edge, or I want you to correctly report that no such path exists. How long does that take? What kind of running time? Good. So what would be what would be a subroutine you can just plug in and basically solve exactly that problem? Dexter Segment is actually slightly overkill. Because we're not looking for a shortest path, we're just looking for a path. Breath first search. Breath first search. Or depth first search. Your favorite linear time graph search algorithm to check whether or not there exists a path in the graph between two designated verbs. Okay. So this is something you already know how to do. And the good news is, is it's linear time, as somebody mentioned. So linear time, by say breadth first search, or depth first search. By the way, I don't know if my uh, handwriting reputation precedes me or not, but uh, I definitely am under no delusions about its sporadic legibility. So I give you all an infinite quota to clarify what I wrote on the board, okay, for handwriting. Keep that in mind. Especially if I get excited, I start writing too fast. Okay. So suppose we, okay, so you might find a path or you might not. So if we don't find a path, then we give up. Okay, so we just stop and we just output whatever the final flow is. Okay. If we do find a path, well then we just do the obvious thing and increase the flow along the path as much as we can. So otherwise, suppose we find a path P. Now there may be many paths P. For now, let's just think about picking one arbitrarily. An arbitrary path from S to T with room on every edge. But capital delta denotes the amount by which we can increase the flow along this path. <coughs> so how much is that? Well, for a given edge, this is how much room we have to increase its flow. Right? That's its capacity. That's how much we're already routing on. On the path overall, well, we have to we have to make sure we satisfy each of the capacity constraints. So we look at the minimum. Over all the edges in the path. Okay. 
So this is the room left on an edge. This is the room left on the path of the room. So this is the minimum amount by which we can increase flow on P without violating capacity constraints, and that's exactly what we did. So that's, a com that's basically a completely specified algorithm. Everyone agree? You feel like you just go code this up in Python in half an hour or something? All right, and again, this is, a, this is a totally reasonable thing to show. Uh, the question, of course, is, you know, does this actually work? All right, so what, what could it mean to not work? Well, it's going, to, it's going to terminate. It's going to output a flow, right? So it maintains the fact that F is a flow by induction. It's an invariant, right? The all zeros, that's a flow. When you, augment, you increase things along a path, well, for any vertex on the path, the incoming <coughs> flow goes up by delta. The outgoing flow also goes up by delta. So they stay equal. Okay. So it's definitely going to terminate with a flow. The way it could fail would be to terminate with a flow which is not a maximum flow. Does anyone see an example where this algorithm might not, it might actually terminate, but with a flow which is not maximum? Hint, there's a total of one network on, on the board. Yeah. Good. And what, go ahead. Well, if you took that network, started to zero, and then you took you did the zigzag first and increased it to, to flow two. Good. So here's the observation. So suppose we try to run this algorithm on that graph. Okay. So if we run it on this graph, so forget about the pink flow. Imagine we erase the pink flow and we go back to the all zero flow. What's the first thing we do? We look for an SP path. Specifically, one that has room on all the edges, but of course, with the zero flow, everything has room. Okay, so all ST paths are legit. We're going to pick one arbitrarily. If we pick the zigzag path, so this one here, and we route three units on the blue zigzag path, and again, that is something that this algorithm might do. If it doesn't, what happens in the next iteration? It looks for some path from S to T where every edge has room on in it, and no longer are there any such paths. Right? Because every SP path includes either the upper left edge or the bottom right edge, both of which are saturated. So that triggers the stopping condition for the algorithm. The flow that it returns has value only three, but we already know that the maximum flow value is equal to five. Is that clear? Any questions? Right. So the first algorithm doesn't work. That's fine. Algorithm design is a process. Right? You start simple, cross your fingers, figure out if it works or not. If it doesn't, you ask, OK, what other ideas are needed? So okay, let me just, uh, so what's the issue? Terminates with a non max flow. Uh, so, this type of non max flow, it's something called a blocking flow. So, that's what it means when you sort of plugged up all of the S key edges. And we'll talk more about blocking flows next lecture as a subroutine in a maximum flow algorithm. Okay, but it may not be maximum. So if we wanted to do something smarter, what could we do? Well, so suppose the algorithm gets stuck here. So it routes these three units on this blue path. You stare at this a while and you're like, eh, yeah, I, I mean, I guess it's sort of stuck in the sense that there's no SD path where everything has room. But if you just sort of allow me to undo something I did last iteration, I can totally make more progress. Right, so like, why can't I just route two units? So suppose the blue flow, the blue path has already been routed, and now imagine we send two units of stuff down here. Now we send it backward, undoing part of what we push downward, and then we just send that two units the rest of the way to T. 
So now with one fell swoop, this one reverse zigzag augmentation, you've actually transformed that blue flow into the maximum pink flow. Okay? So that's sort of the intuition. It's kind of like, well, you know, it's a greedy algorithm. You're not supposed to be able to like undo things. But maybe we can just have sort of a next level greedy algorithm where we have limited undo power. Namely, if we routed something in one direction, we're free to route it back the other direction later if we want. So that's idea number two, and that's the only other idea we need to get our first correct maximum flow algorithm. Okay, so idea allow undo. So we need to, you know, it's, it's sort of clear what we mean in this specific example, but we need to be principled about this. Right? We need to figure out a way to sort of tell a computer, sort of really encode as an algorithm, what you're allowed to do in each iteration of the new, more sophisticated, greedy algorithm. And so we're going to use <coughs> So that brings us to a very simple, but also sort of really important definition that of a residual graph. Okay, and again, the point of the residual graph is to encode what are the allowable undo operations. Okay, that's the point of this definition. So suppose you have a network G, and you've got a current flow F. And again, think about an example being that blue flow and that network on the top. So let F be a flow in G. I'm going to explain to you what is the corresponding residual graph. G sub F. Okay? So given a graph, given a flow, I'm going to tell you about a new graph called the residual graph, G sub F. What happens is that you keep the exact same vertex set, so the vertices are the same as in G. Each edge in G spawns two edges in G sub F, one going forward, one going backward. The point of the backward edge is to encode the undo operation. So if in G you have an edge from U to V where the current flow is F sub E and the capacity is U sub E, this will give rise in G sub F to two edges. forward edge, meaning one going the same direction as the edge in G, and this will have residual capacity UE minus FE. Okay, which again makes sense. It started with UE units of capacity, you've already routed F sub E, so the amount of residual capacity capacity that's left is the difference. The reverse arc, this is where the meaning is to undo previous stuff that you routed. So for the reverse arc, the residual capacity is defined as F sub E. So you used to have an edge with capacity U, flow F. That gives us two edges, a forward edge with residual capacity U minus F. Backward capacity, a reverse edge with capacity So let's actually draw the residual network for this graph and the blue flow. This edge, uh, oh, I should mention, um, it's possible that when you pass to the residual network, you might wind up with up to two parallel edges between two vertices in either direction. But that's fine. That causes no problems for any of the algorithms that we're going to talk about. All right, so for this network, there are five edges. So in the corresponding residual network, we'd expect to see ten edges. Because each edge on, in G gives rise to two edges in opposite directions in G sub F. Again, F I'm taking to be the blue zigzag flow. Now actually, of these 10 edges, 
four of them just have zero residual capacity. Okay? Namely, if I look at the bottom left and upper right edges, I haven't sent any flow forward at all yet. So the reverse arc has residual capacity zero. And the forward version of the upper left and lower right edges, because I've already maxed out of the capacity, the forward versions of those edges have no residual capacity left. So I'm just going to omit those four edges from the picture. We'll be left with a network with six edges. And so what is it? So we have the backward version of the threes. We still have the forward version of the twos. And now this is the one where we actually get both the forward and the reverse version. So the forward version goes in the same direction as the original. Over here we had original capacity 5. We're sending three units of flow. So for the forward version, we have two units residual capacity. And then the reverse edge, corresponding to an undo operation, has three units of residual capacity. So that's the residual network in this graph and the blue flow. Any questions about that? And I want you to notice that something that we sort of hand wave through it now shows up very precisely in the residual network. We talked about how it was sort of annoying to get stuck with the blue flow, because intuitively we just wanted to route two units on the reverse zigzag path, undoing some of our previous work routing downward. And so that, that sort of routing, that undoing op op uh, operation, translates very directly into routing two units of flow on this particular path in the residual network. Okay? So in the residual network, again, I'll give you the formal algorithm in a second, it's just to make sure you have your intuition is in the right shape. When you route traffic through the residual network, intuitively, on all of the forward edges, you're doing the same thing you were doing before. If it had some capacity left over, you're now increasing the flow value. Whenever you route track, whenever you route flow on an edge, which corresponds to a reverse edge, that's undoing flow that you routed in the forward direction in the past. Okay. okay. So that's the residual graph. So, what's cool, like I said, we don't need any more ideas. So basically we're just going to do the greedy algorithm except in the residual graph. Other than that, we're going to do everything exactly as before, and that's going to work. It's not obvious it works. I have to prove to you it works, but it's going to work. So it's very nice. So let me sort of do it at a sort of edit distance from our naive greedy algorithm. So test number two is actually a famous algorithm, the Ford Fulkerson algorithm. long time ago, mid-50s. Starts the same. Initialize with a zero flow. Now, here we're going to do a different search. Right? So this is the whole bug with the naive greedy algorithm, is it gave up too easily. It might be the case that can't find a path from S to T, where there's residual capacity in every edge. But still, if you can undo stuff, you can make more progress. So what we're going to do, Instead of writing search for a path P so that the flow is less than the capacity on every entity, we're going to say search for a path P in the residual network. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Search for an SD path P in the current residual network G sub F. At all given times, we're going to have some flow F. So at any given time, there's a corresponding residual graph G sub F. It may or may not have an SP path, but we want to know. We're going to look for an SP path that is there. Just like before, this is just a graph search subroutine. Right? Literally, you're just checking for the existence of an SP path in the residual graph. DFS, DFS, whatever, gives you linear time implementation. It 
If you don't find an SD path in a residual graph, we don't know what to do, so we're going to halt. If we do find a path from S to T in the residual graph, we want to augment along it. We want to augment along it as much as we can. So in the residual network, the forward edges have this as their residual capacity, but the reverse edges have just F sub E as their residual capacity. So let me just replace this. Sorry, I guess I meant to do edits. min of the residual capacity of So what does it mean to augment along the path in the residual graph? Well, it's a mixture of increasing the amount of flow on the forward edges and decreasing the amount of flow on the edges corresponding to reverse it. So now we're going to say, instead of just for all edges E and P, we're going to say for all forward edges E and P, add delta to F sub E, and for all reverse edges E and P, Tracks delta from <coughs> and that's the that's the entire full purpose now. So any questions about its definition? You're gonna, if you feel like you have trouble coding this up in Python in a short amount of time, if something doesn't make sense, let me know. So, just as a sanity check, back in our running example, so again, there may be many choices of this path. Okay, so in the residual graph, there may be lots and lots of paths from S to T. Today, let's just think about picking an arbitrary one. We'll be smarter about that choice on Thursday. So, if you run this full focus in algorithm on our running example, the white network, again, in the first iteration, it might do the same thing as our naive greedy algorithm. It might well route the three units along that blue zigzag path. But now, unlike the main PD algorithm, it doesn't give up. It forms the residual network and looks at the S2 path there. And it finds one, namely the purple path. It looks at the biggest residual capacity of the three edges on the purple path. It looks at, excuse me, the smallest residual capacity, which is two. So that's two units along that path, which corresponds to increasing the amount of flow here by two, Increasing the amount of flow here by two, and decreasing the amount of flow here by two. And once we do that, we get exactly the red maximum flow. That's when two iterations, the full focus and does indeed recover the maximum flow in this particular example. It's hardly a proof that it always works, but it's a sanity check that at least it fixes the problem we have with the naive greedy algorithm. Any questions? So, let's talk about whether or not this works. Okay, well, I mean, for all we know, this 3D algorithm is as broken as our previous one. If it works in this example, great, but it's not clear what that tells us more generally. So, I want to focus on correctness. Today we're not going to talk about running time at all. We'll talk about that in future lectures. So let's just try to understand whether or not the full Ferguson algorithm terminates with a maximum flow. Well, so first of all, I certainly claim that it terminates. sanity check when they explain why this thing can't run forever. I mean, intuitively, it's because it keeps making progress. It keeps sending more and more flow. At some point, you're going to run out of flow to set. Okay. 
The towns are really good. Uh, the first claim is that the Ford Focus and algorithm maintains a flow f. Okay. So obviously, you start with the all zero flow, that's a flow. The claim is every time you do one of these augmentations, you again get a flow. So strictly speaking, there's sort of like four cases here, because in a given vertex in the path, both the incoming and the outgoing edge might be a forward edge or a reverse edge. You know, but for example, if they're both forward edges, then the flow in goes up by delta, the flow out goes, out, goes up by delta, so we just do the same. If they're both reverse edges, the flow in goes down by delta, the flow out goes down by delta, so they stay the same, and so on. It's all four cases are fine. So augment, augmenting along a path in the residual graph yields another flow. It maintains the uh, in particular, the conservation constraints. The second thing which is worth noting, and this is why, for convenience, this is why I assume that the capacities are integral, integers, <coughs> I claim that at all times, the current flow F uses only integer values. And again, like the previous one, this is going to be by induction on the number of iterations. If it's true so far, all the flow values are integers. Well, remember, the capacities are also integers. So everything in the residual network is an integer. So delta is going to be an integer. So the flow stays an integer. And it just keeps repeating. Why is that interesting? Why is that useful? Well, if it stays in integral, then it means every iteration, you're routing at least one unit of flow. So delta can't be smaller than one. They're all to be at least one. Right? You're sort of worried like about a Zeno's paradox. Right? Maybe you route a half and then a fifth and then a twenty-fifth, and you're worried it never stops. But given that you send at least one unit of flow every iteration, and given that there's a finite amount of capacity, you say, out of the source vertex, that's clear it can't go on forever. It's got to terminate. When it terminates, it terminates with the flow. So again, the only way it could not be correct is if the flow terminates when it is not maximum. Okay, so I'm not claiming a maximum flow right now. I'm claiming this terminates with a flow. Okay. But you know, we, we just said all this stuff about the naive greedy algorithm. All of this exact same facts are true. Right? I mean, no, that one doesn't work. So what's different now? Well, obviously, what we're hoping is that because the residual network <coughs> includes more augmenting paths than in our naive greedy algorithm by having these reverse arcs, we expect it to make more progress before it finally gives up and stops. The question is, does it get all the way there before it stops? So this leads us to sort of a very basic question, which is going to be really you know, maybe the major theme in the first half of the course, which is just when we're designing an algorithm, like this algorithm for maximum flow, how do we know when we're done? By which I mean, we've got a flow in our hands. How do we know whether or not it's a maximum flow? Okay. Right, so really, if we want to terminate this algorithm and be correct, we need to somehow know or be able to prove that our stopping condition implies that you can't do any better. Okay? That's what it means to prove that an algorithm like this correctly computes the maximum flow. It knows that you're done at the end. And this is relevant, you know, frankly, this is relevant even if I just sort of handed you, say there's a big network, and I gave you a flow, and I alleged that it was a maximum flow. Is there some simple way, some simple check you could do to see if I'm lying or telling the truth? If I wanted to convince you something was not a maximum flow, that would be easy enough. I'd just show you a different flow that was even bigger. You'd be like, oh yeah, at this point, it was a maximum. But what if I want to show you that there is no flow better than this one? How would I filter that? Yeah? Try to find a path in the residual graph. Right, so, good. So, then I think where you're getting at is if you don't, then there's a bigger one. No, no, so if you do find a path in the residual graph, then I can show you the bigger one. Okay, so we're, so you're getting ahead of us, but it's a good point. We're interested in the converse, right? So suppose this algorithm fails to make progress. Is that because no more progress is possible, or is it because our algorithm is too dumb? Right, so our first algorithm stopped, but it was because the algorithm was dumb. It wasn't because we had the right solution. 
And so now we're again in the same quandary. I've already kind of given it away that here actually you are correct at the end. But how do you know? How does the algorithm somehow know it's done at the end? Sure, that'd be great if I define an income. <laughs> so we'll, we'll do that formally uh, on uh, next slide. So how do we know that we're done? Okay. So the algorithm's at some point, it's terminated, why can't you do better? And so again, this is going to come up over and over again in the problems we study in the first half. It'll culminate with linear programming duality, which is in some sense like the ultimate answer of how you know when you're done, uh, at least for problems that tend to be polynomial time solved. Okay, so maybe just to illustrate the point, to show you what I'm talking about, suppose I keep the same network, but I just change the capacities a little bit. Oh, so I, right, so I should, I should recall, at the very beginning of the lecture, we had a max flow example, and it just didn't seem like a big deal to know that we were done. Right? We just drew the pink flow, and sent five units, we said, well, just look at the source. You can't have more than five units coming out of the source. So clearly, that, you, you, you've met the best case scenario. Good job, you're next. But I try to tweak the capacities a little bit. flow value is like 100 or more or something. <coughs> but what if I tried to tell you that actually the best flow only sends three units? So consider the following flow in green. So I said three out of S split one two. <coughs> Symmetric on the other side, and then one up and none down. So one thing that's easy to check is that this is indeed a flow. Capacity constraints are satisfied, so are conservation. You know, two units going in here, two units going out on those two paths. So this is a flow of value three. But do you really believe that there couldn't be anything better than sending three units with all of these like huge capacities lying around? Certainly the total amount of stuff that the source can send out is 101, way, way, way bigger than three. Same thing for the sink T. Right? There's no obstacle here. Okay. So how would you convince someone that this is a maximum flow? Well, I'm going to do this formally on Thursday, which is to kind of you know, plant the seeds, do the foreshadowing. Here's the idea. <coughs> Suppose, rather than looking only at what's happening around the source, or what's happening around the sink, Suppose I split the graph actually into two pieces, which are sort of more complicated. Okay. So I'm going to single out the source and also this bottom vertex. Look at all of the edges that go out of this set, meaning that either go out of the source or go out of this vertex. What is the total capacity available <coughs> on all of the edges going out of this set? Three. Right? So, I claim, again, I'll make this precise Thursday, that this is the exact same kind of obstacle to having a flow of a certain value. Okay? Before it was a little simpler, you just look at the source, there's only five units out, so you can't do better than five. But here, now I've drawn kind of like a big moat around, you know, with the source somewhere in the middle, and the capacity across anywhere of this moat is only three. Okay? All flow going to the sink has to cross this moat, so there's only three units of capacity. The best case scenario, is that you send a full three units through that uh, cut. Of the okay? So that's the idea. That's sort of where we're going. That's how we're going to sort of know that we're done in maximum flow problems. We'll be able to actually exhibit obstacles called cuts of this form, showing you that this prove that you can't do better than the flow you have so far. Okay. So that's a little bit of a digression. Let me be a little more precise now. and explain how we're going to go about answering this question, how do we know when we're done, how we're going to go about answering that question in this class.
So the approach, which I'm going to be advocating, and which is classical, is going to be a two-step approach to answering this question. Step one is we're going to identify what are known as optimality conditions. So this part of the paradigm is structural. It's not algorithmic. Okay, so there's no algorithms in part one. You just identify a sufficient condition where if the condition is met, then you know that you're optimal. So for example, you know that a flow is maximum. Okay, I'll give you an example in a second. Okay. So the first goal is to write down a sufficient condition for correctness, sufficient condition for optimality. And then the second part is to design an algorithm where it only terminates when it gets when it meets these optimality conditions. So design an algorithm that terminates for the optimality conditions set. So just by definition if we can do both steps one and two, it will follow that this algorithm is correct, is optimal. The optimality conditions give you a sufficient condition for correctness, and the algorithm is going to always be correct. And this is actually, this really didn't come up in CS161, if you think about it. There's plenty of correctness proofs in 161, but like none of them are interesting. Right? They're all like, really boring induction with no ideas required. Think about like merge source or something, you know, divide and conquer algorithms. Think about Dijkstra's algorithms, just a simple induction on a number of vertices. Think about dynamic programming. Right? You did the subproblems right, you get the overall problem right. End of story. So the problems in 261 are going to require this more sophisticated approach. Okay? You're, not, you're not really going to be able to get away with just sort of at the same time doing the algorithm, doing the analysis, and being correct. We need to actually take a step back, think about the problem, think about what it means to be optimal, and use that as a guideline to come up with what are sometimes not the first algorithm that you might think about. And even full focusing is sort of an example of that. Maybe it's the second algorithm you think about, but it's not the first. So I know this is a little abstract, so how would this work, for example, for the maximum flow problem? So here's a claim. It's not hard to prove, but I'm going to defer the proof until Thursday, because we've already covered a lot today. And the point of this claim is to identify optimality conditions for the maximum flow problem. Sufficient condition for a flow to be maximum. And this was, there was a question alluding to this uh, a little earlier. So suppose you have a flow and a graph, flow f and a graph g, and the residual graph g sub f has no path from S to T. The claim is this is a sufficient condition for optimality. Okay. So if there's no S T path in the residual graph, then F is a maximum flow. So again, I'll prove this to you at the beginning of Thursday. It's not bad. But for now, let's just sort of accept this as true and see what it implies. Okay, so this is part one, sufficient condition for optimal conditions. Part two says design an algorithm that terminates with those conditions satisfied. Well, what's the stopping condition of the full focusing algorithm? The stopping condition is exactly that there's no steep path to the residual graph. So actually, we've already solved part two. We already have an algorithm that only terminates when the conditions are satisfied. So as a corollary, we get the full purpose of an algorithm is correct. <coughs> Meaning that it's guaranteed to terminate with the maximum, unlike the naive greedy algorithm that we started with. Okay. So again, just to be clear, I haven't proved the claim. So you shouldn't necessarily see why the claim is true, but you should understand why 
the claim implies the court. And if that doesn't make sense, please ask the question. Yeah. Is the claim the only optimal condition for a max flow? Uh, I mean, it's, it's hard to know how to phrase uniqueness for optimality okay. conditions, but it's by far the most ubiquitous one. And it's the only one we'll have occasion to use in the course. Yeah. So this, this, is, this will be very useful for us. All of our max flow algorithms, this will prove that. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, good question. Uh, so yes, uh, there are ways to remove the invalid condition. So the first thing to realize is just that you know rational numbers may as well be integers, but you can always just clear denominators for rational to make them integral. And of course, if you just multiply everything by a thousand, it doesn't change the problem. So the only difference would be between rationals and real numbers, and then it sort of depends what you're trying to do. I mean, talking about algorithms. It's actually gets so annoying to even talk about what does it mean for an algorithm to you know manipulate numbers with no finite representation. If you just want to talk about like structural results, then you can do simple limiting arguments. So if it's true for rationals, it's sort of true for reasons. So the max flow min cut theorem, for example, I'll prove it on Thursday for the integers, but it's true for the real as well. Other questions? <coughs> if the original graph has um, between two nodes that just going both ways, Good. how are we going to go Good. So the residual graph will just have two parallel edges going either direction. And there's no big deal. Now in an implementation, in a real implementation, you might want to think about merging parallel arcs that go the same direction. But for lecture, let's just have this sort of wasteful representation where we have possibly twice as many edges as what we started with. But you're right. I mean, that you do get, in general, get two in each direction. More questions? I don't really see the two in the same direction condition. Like why would you get two in different in directions? Graph, yeah, in the graph. Just so it's just because every every edge of the original graph gives rise to both a forward and a backward. So imagine you started with a graph mm -hmm. with an edge going, say, upward and a parallel and a sort of edge going the opposite direction. Oh sure, okay. Yeah. okay. So that's all. So then the forward one would give you two each direction, the other one would give you two. Other questions? So the plan going forward on Thursday, I'll prove the claim to you, finishing the correctness of full Ferguson. I'm going to state and prove a, a famous and beautiful result known as the max flow min cut theorem, which is another way to think about these optimality conditions, how to think about how are you done in the max flow problem. And then we're going to turn our attention to fast algorithms. See you then.